Thank you, Marina. Can I get the first? Oh, thank you so much. Um, so my lecture is about engineering and the need to reinvent engineering education and, as a result, engineering practice to address the needs of about 5 billion people on this planet, 5 billion people whose job is to try to stay alive by the end of the day. These are people who need water, sanitation, energy, shelter. These are the things that we take for granted, but for those 5 billion people, it is not the case. Let me start with the conclusions of my presentation, in case I run out of time. First one is doing something about those 5 billion people for us is no longer an option, it is an obligation. A moral obligation to make this world a better place. Number two, to do that, we need to change the mindset. Einstein had a great quote, problems cannot be solved with the same level of thinking that created them. Poverty was created with a level of thinking, and therefore we cannot use that same mindset to solve those problems of poverty. Number three, in my conclusion, is that the only way we can do that is by endorsing compassion. A world without compassion is not a world worth living in. A sustainable world is a compassionate world, or it is not, period. And number four, I'm going to talk about what is the gift that each one of us has in this room? What is our individual mission statement that essentially allows us to move forward and make this world a better place? We need to be the change that we want to see in the world. Short of that, it's not worth living. A sustainable world is a compassionate world, or it is not, period. How did I get started in this type of project? I studied in a small village in Belize. How did I get involved in engineering for the developing world? I worked in that small village there in Belize where that little girl there really changed my life. I was asked to essentially come up with a solution so that little girl could carry water back and forth from the river to the village, back and forth, essentially. Um, so the idea is that was to prevent her from, from doing that. Could I come up with a solution so she did not have to carry the water from the river to the village all day long? So we came up with a solution, essentially, and included some students as part of that solution. Five students came to my doorstep, 10 students, 15, 20 students. All in a sudden, I was flooded with students all interested in what we call the Belize Project. A year later, the students and I put together a pump. We designed a pump, and we were able to lift the water 120 feet using a waterfall, the energy of the waterfall. Because at the middle of the jungle there, there is no electric plug for a pump. And that community there uh, makes essentially less than one dollar a day. So I had to change my way of, in, of doing engineering completely there. I could not use the same solutions that I was teaching to my students or that I had learned through my own training. I had to create a new type of engineering and what we call that engineering for the developing world. What came out of this project? One Engineers Without Borders. Ten years later, Engineers Without Borders USA has now 12,000 members across the United States. We are working in 48 different countries and we have about 300 chapters and about 400 projects around the world. We also started a program at the University of Colorado called Engineering for the Developing World because we need to train young people before they go into the field. The message that I really want to convey to do it today is this idea of engineering with compassion. This idea of engineering with a human face, engineering with heart. Most of our institutions today do not have soul anymore. We have soulless groups on this planet. Political system, soulless political system, soulless educational system, soulless religious system, soulless economic system. And we really need to change that. If we don't change, again, that compassionate part of education, politics, economics, business, this is very dangerous for the planet. So out of this project came uh, essentially Engineers Without Borders. And the students were all excited. When I asked the students, how come you are excited about this kind of project, they told me, well, it is a meaningful project. Where is meaning? in Tuesday's education. Let me remind you that the concept of a university 900 years ago was for young people to find their place in the universe. Well, <laughs> we got lost into the mission statement here. Yeah, you find your place in the universe in here. You find your place in the universe 
on a refugee camp in Haiti. You find your place in the universe in India. Yes, that's where you find your place in the universe. You certainly don't find your place in the universe in, in universities today, I can tell you that. The systems are congested, are constipated, and they need the high dose of Malanta, I can tell you that. <laughs> I can tell you that, because I'm part of that system. It's pathetic. So where do you find your place in the universe? And I think that Engineers Without Borders provides a way for young people to find our place in the universe. And we better do that. We better need, we need to go into the field and make this world a better place. This is an obligation, not an option anymore. Statistics. 1.2 billion people do not have clean water on this planet. 2.4 billion people are at risk of malaria. 30,000 children die every day for reasons that are purely preventable. 1.6 billion people do not have electricity. 1.8 billion people live in conflict zones. Now, how much money are we spending on military expenditures in the entire planet per year? It's $1.5 trillion, and if you divide that by 365 days, divide that by 24 hours, divide that by 60 minutes, and by 60 seconds, you know how much we spend? $32,000 a second. Wow! Here is one species in the entire universe that is capable of accepting to spend $32,000 a second that is perfectly comfortable in that 30,000 children die every day for reasons that are purely preventable. Oh, hey! Are we nuts? Are we nuts? Are those numbers not appalling? If you are not reacting to those numbers, are you made out of stones? And if you don't like it, there are folks not a few miles away from here who make decisions about it. It's time to wake up. I'm French, that's why I like to create revolutions, right? It's time to wake up. It's time to do something about those numbers because those numbers don't tell us this is an advanced species on this planet. This is a, this is a species that is self-destructive. This is a species that is in denial and denial of denial. And that's dangerous. Denial is a five-letter word, denial of denial. We are denying that we are in denial. Dangerous for the planet. Dangerous for the 10,000 species that are ripped off from the book of creation every year by being extinct. We are ripping off 10,000 species from the book of creation every year. And we are comfortable with it, as if there's a Xerox copy somewhere on the shelves. We are comfortable in losing one native culture a year since 1900, as if there's a copy somewhere else. Wow! It's time to think. It's time to pause. It's time to reflect. It's time to endorse compassion. Passion ways. Compassion is passion ways. So for me, well, what I'm trying to do is to create this new generation of engineers for the 21st century. Engineers who can think out of the box, not just a bunch of uh, technical nerds. That's true that most engineers are nerds. But instead, individuals who can endorse compassion, who can endorse sustainable development, appropriate technology, who can endorse peacemaking. A week from now, we'll be in Cyprus. I'm bringing 36 people this year from Engineers Without Borders, Jordan, Palestine, Israel, Egypt, Cyprus, Greece, Macedonia. We had a project like that last year, and essentially to look at problems that come onto the area. And that area, somewhere like here. Here are the places where we have Engineers Without Borders. Engineers Without Borders is in 47 different countries around the world. What do we have in common there? Peace? Yeah. It's an outcome. I'm sick and tired of going to those meetings on peace. They talk about peace. Well, what about peace as an outcome? What about bringing engineers together who are going to look at the problem of water in a region, pollution in a region, sanitation in a region, energy in a region? Yeah, now we are talking about it. We are talking about a common denominator that will translate into peacemaking where people have something in common, they do something, they just don't talk about peace endlessly, all day long, all day long, until they're not peaceful anymore. <laughs> it's absolutely pathetic, that peace business. Yeah, there are also ways of doing it, and what I'm trying here is through the Abraham Path Initiative, which is a great initiative that started at Harvard. Essentially, that's an initiative that, where that follows essentially that tracks the path of Abraham, 1,200 kilometers, uh, that, that essentially, essentially Abraham, Abraham, hey, is the guy who is responsible for essentially three major religions, and that comprises about three billion people on this planet. 
hey, we have something in common there. What about walking the path? What about working on young Israelis and young Palestinians and young Jordanians walking along the path, and especially engineers, and that's what we're going to do in October, and identify some villages along the path and say, hey, what do those people need? Water, okay, let's look at the Israeli solution, the Jordanian solution, the Egyptian solution, and let's see if we can come up something together. We are talking about now something that is really tangible. Now, at the University of Colorado, we have a program of study that essentially forces our students, our engineering nerds there, to get out of their nerdy behavior. And the way you take a nerdy engineer into the real world, you make sure that that engineer doesn't know everything about engineering and technology. You make sure that that person knows about public health, about governance, about business, security, and so on and so forth. And then you bring them into the real world and you let them eat some dirt there in the real world. And you make them realize how much a little do they know. I remember a project in Nepal. There was a master's student there. She was crying. And I said, why are you crying? Well, because the people in a village know more about how to make concrete than I do. <laughs> oh, yeah? I said, what kind of training did you get? Well, I took uh, strengths of materials, basic concrete design, advanced concrete design. She was not even capable of making a slab of concrete. And local people there were smarter than she was. And there was a problem there. And believe me, I've seen that over and over again. Our goal is to create stable and secure communities. And to do that, we need the field of appropriate technology. Look at this quote from Schumacher. Find out what people do and help them do it better. I'm not telling, hey, let's go to a village and find a solution and tell them what to do. My philosophy is that local people are more have talent. They have creativity. They live there. They know how to live there. They, they have roots. They have been there for many, many, many different generations. I, as an individual, cannot tell them what to do. In terms of development, there are three levels of development. Bottom up, top down, and outside in. And the three converge. This talent, in fact, let me tell you, there's more talent in most villages that I see around the world than the engineering department at the University of Colorado. Talent, real talent, tangible talent. And what we are talking about here is more than teaching people how to fish. It's teaching people how to fish, how to design a big fishing cane, how to make those fishing canes, how to skin the fish, how to can the fish, how to sell those cans and create an entire fishing industry. Now we are talking. Now we are talking about social entrepreneurship. That is a continuum all the way from engineering, technology, governance, all the way to business development. Now we are talking. And to do that, you need to tap into the local talent. You need to tap into what's available. And believe me, there's plenty available. There's more available than you can think of. Here's an example of, since I have limited amount of time, I'm going to give you one example of a social entrepreneurship enterprise that we started in Kabul. I've been in Kabul since 2003, Kabul, Afghanistan. And in Kabul, there's no wood. The Russians and the Taliban destroyed all the trees. The weather in Kabul is extremely cold in the wintertime, 7,000 feet. How do you find wood for heating, for, how do you find fuel for heating and cooking? So what we did, um, what, what I did by accident or not, I met this gentleman, Sanu Kaji from Kathmandu, who is a social entrepreneur, and he makes those briquettes. What is in there? Well, you find sawdust, paper, cardboard, trash, uh, any trash you want except plastic. You make a sludge, you compress it. It's a little bit more complex than that. And you compress it, and you come up with a briquette. Uh, the Legacy Foundation is another group in the United States that makes those briquettes. Sanu Kaji makes those briquettes. That briquette here essentially will burn for about 20 minutes. That was in July or March of 2008, where we brought Sanu Kaji to uh, Kabul to start a workshop. In July of 2008, we had an entire business going on. An entire business. What we did was to take 20 street children, boys, from the prostitution ring of Kabul. The people at the lowest of the lowest who have been exploited for years in Kabul, and we trained them how to make those briquettes. They essentially make briquettes in the morning, and in the afternoon they go to school for four hours. They make $50 a month when most people in Kabul make less than $1 a day. 
Uh, the press there that you see on the right was actually designed uh, precisely for handicapped people because we also took five handicapped young men from the streets of Kabul and we trained them to become managers. One is in charge of materials, one is in charge of accounting, and those managers make $200 a day, uh, $200 a month. Um, we are about at 82 children now, after one year. 82 children who were taken from the streets of Kabul, from the cycle of, from the cycle of prostitution, who are now making a living and going to school in the afternoon. That's the good bread that was made. One of the bakers decided to use the briquettes instead of the wood and, um, and was able to sell the bread at 30% less than the bread made out of wood. So when you make one dollar a day, Paying 30% less for your bread is very meaningful. Um, quote, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. As I mentioned to you, it's very important to change the mindset. Uh, the significant problems we face cannot be solved with the same level of thinking that created them. We need a new mindset in a way we approach poverty, in a way we approach international development, in a way we educate our children in schools, and that's not just in engineering school, I should say exactly the same thing in economics, in business, in politics, in religion. Our major institutions today are mentally, physically, psychologically sick. Period. We need a big dose, again, of Malenta to decongestion those institutions. And that has to be done from the bottom up. Remember, those young people who came to me when I did that project in Belize, what attracted them to that project was meaning. I see young people today who are searching for meaning. Give me meaning in engineering. Give me meaning in education. Give me meaning in health. Give me meaning in economics. Meaning. Understand that. This is a very profound statement. Half of the women, uh, half of the people in our graduate program at the University of Colorado are women. 53% when the average enrollment across the United States is only 20%. What are we doing right here? I'll tell you what we are doing right. We are reawakening that sense of compassion, that sense of caring that women have more than men. Men have it too, but they are afraid of expressing it. How come we don't talk about love on campus? Hey, love is a four-letter word that nobody wants to talk about on campus. We hear about a lot of other four-letter words on campus. How come we don't talk about love? How long do we talk about compassion? How come we don't talk about teaching young people to include compassion into politics, into economics? How come we don't have any soul? How come we don't talk about that other four-letter word, word that is called soul? And I want to finish that my presentation with this picture of smiles, because after all, if you do something and you don't bring smiles, you may want to think twice about why you are doing it. Frankly. You see too many smiles when you listen to those stupid politicians on TV? No. They are really constipated, some more than others. <laughs> Frankly, there's a problem of constipation on this planet. But look at the smiles. Top diagram there, a little girl from Peru, where they installed essentially a telemedicine, tele-education system to bring essentially education from one side to another side, where that little girl, the teacher, is located 50 kilometers away. Stop right there, look at those children, look at the smiles of young Nepalese students when the students at the University of Colorado installed a solar system on top and they connected that as a source of electricity. Look at the smiles, or oh, the smiles of the children of Rwanda and finally the bottom right there, the smiles of those children from the streets of Kabul who 18 months ago were exploited sexually and now have hope, have education. It's just amazing. And let me finish with one statement, and that was my last conclusion. What I'm asking you to do, and I'm a teacher, I cannot help being a teacher, is during the time of this conference, is to sit down over a cup of coffee, and you have to be by yourself, and write down your mission statement, your own mission statement, your gift. Each one of you here, each one of us here, came with a unique gift that we are supposed to give to the entire universe during our lifetime. Find it. And once you find it, scratch it, the next day start all over again. There's no pass-fail here. But by doing so that, by going through that exercise, you will find who you are, what you are here for. And believe me, the day you find that, you better fasten your seatbelt. Thank you.